Welcome everyone, I'm technically not a technician, and in today's video, I'm going to show you how I easily added working coin door buttons to my arcade 1UP Simpsons arcade cabinet with the mystery Dawson experience. Well, that and a few extra parts. This video is for educational purposes only and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any videos or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. With our customary legal precautions and the introduction out of the way, let's talk shop. For those of you who follow the channel, you're aware that the Mystery Dawson experience now gives us access to all four player controls when using third-party apps and emulators like RetroArch, all the while letting us retain the ability to play repackaged APK files. This in itself is awesome, but what if I told you there is more? What if I told you that Team Encoder's four-player fix also gives us access to the four blank inputs on the Simpsons Arcade 1UP controller board? Because in reality, that's exactly what I'm telling you. You should now be asking yourself, what do I need to make this happen? Well, let me tell you, and let's start with the tools needed for this arcade mod. You're going to need a common screwdriver, a 1 1 8 inch hole saw, a power drill, and a simple soldering iron. If you're like me, you may want a helpful tool called a soldering iron third hand. The third hand is optional, but good lord, does it ever help? If you don't have these tools, do not worry, as you can find links to all of them in the description. For full disclosure, they are affiliate links, and if used, this channel will get a small referral. Now let's talk parts. The first thing we'll need is an arcade 1UP Simpsons cab. Obviously, we need the cab, but there are a few items on the cab that we'll need to modify. The first is the front panel of our cab. Next will be the two molded coin doors, and the last stock item that we'll need to modify is the control board. All of these items will come with your cab, and as long as you have one, you will not need to source them. We also have a few items that you'll need to get. To modify our control board, we need to order some 2.54mm plugs. These plugs will need to be soldered to the control board. We'll be needing some cabling for the buttons, and I'm going with 18.2 gauge. 18 gauge is larger than needed, as the current for this isn't strong at all, and the buttons are only looking for a closed loop. However, this 18 gauge wire seems to work better than the lighter 22 gauge wire when coupled with the spade connectors that we'll be using. We'll need the spade connectors to connect to the square buttons that we'll be using as coin buttons on arcades or the select button for consoles. As far as hardware and tools, that's about everything we need, but there is also a software side that will need to be completed. The software part is very important, as without it, you will not end up with working buttons. In short, you'll need to install and patch the Mystery Dawson experience by Team Encoder. If you don't know, the Mystery Dawson experience gives you access to all four player controls in third-party emulators like RetroArch. This option also gives you universal access to the volume controls. As stated earlier, it also gives you access to the blank input spots on the control board for four new buttons. If that doesn't tickle your fancy, Team Encoder also added an exclusion page for repackaged APKs. If you've not done this, do not worry, I've got you covered. Just check out the step-by-step -step guide on how to get it installed and patched. You're also going to need a way to manage all your APKs and your third-party emulators, and I've got your back on that too. All you'll need for that is this video on setting up all your navigation and installing and setting up RetroArch. I've also got a video on the low battery bug. This is optional, but it's been working for me, and the video also shows you how you can reroute your USB ports to the front of your cab. Regardless, you'll need to modify your cab as I have done in these first two videos if you wish to have the same outcome as I. Now that all of the prerequisites are out of the way, let's talk buttons. I've chosen to add coin door buttons. Some will say I should have gone with action buttons, and I totally understand why someone would prefer an action button to a coin button. However, I think we can get greater console compatibility in gameplay if we add a coin button, as it can also double as a select key on consoles, and some console games require you to use the select key to enter menus and make selections. I've got two Simpsons cabs, and if I find that I want that action key, I could mod my other cab, with a third action key, as that will open up three button arcade games. When I built my second stock Simpsons cab, I purposely did not install the front panel. 
in fact, I took the panel down to my garage and got started figuring out how to make the stop buttons work. When piddling around with the coin doors, I saw that the coin buttons on the door looked as if the original design may have used working buttons, and the coin button inserts that come with the stop doors could be modified and made pressable, as the top of each insert has a half hinge keeping it in place. Basically, all I did to make these coin inserts pressable was remove the bottom screw completely, and I backed the top screw out as much as I was able to, then secured it in the screw hole with some common modeling glue. Now that we have the inserts ready, let me show you what they will press against and what we need to do to the front panel. For the modifications to our front panel, we'll simply use our modded coin door and our square buttons as a guide to estimate where our hole placement should go. For my holes, I centered the button so the bottom of the coin inserts would come into contact with the center of the button when pressed. This makes sure that each time I press the modified insert, the insert will, in turn, make contact and press the button, activating the button switch. With the inserts ready and the mounting holes made in our front panel, let's talk about the square buttons we will be mounting behind the coin doors that our inserts will press against. The square buttons that I picked are simple white LED buttons. I picked them because I liked the footprint on the button face. It seemed as if the area would make nice contact with the insert. This button comes in six parts, the first three are for mounting and make up the front of the switch. The last three are for the switch and LED, and they make up the back of the switch. I picked the color white, as I want mine to look like a stock arcade one-up cap. However, the LEDs do come in other colors, and your only limitation seems to be the yellow tint on the inserts themselves. After mounting my square buttons on my front panel, I'll remount the molded coin doors with our modified inserts, and we can start making a wire harness. Because the coin buttons are not on the control panel, we'll have to build a wire harness that can reach from the coin buttons on the front panel of the cab to the PCB control board that is housed in the top control deck. I'm going to make the harness in two sections, one side for the PCB in the top control deck and one for the buttons on the front panel. We'll obviously be starting with the coin button side of our harness. These coin buttons also have LED lights, so I believe I'll be able to power up the button's LEDs off of the marquee power outlet. However, the marquee power outlet is an odd size, and I've yet to put in the effort to source the needed adapter. That said, I will wire the LEDs for power today, so they will be ready when I source the adapter. Each of these LEDs has a very low current and voltage draw. I've not done the math, but they should be able to share a single power source, and we should be able to wire them as a parallel circuit. As you can see, I'll also be using the red and black wires for the LED power. This is in an effort to easily identify and separate the power from the coin switches. The cabling that I'm using started life as 18 4 gauge security cabling, and I've stripped the wire back to the two pairs and separated both pairs so I can divide them between the power and the coin switches. The basic principle here is to fit the female spade connectors that correspond to the coin doors LED and the switches male spade connections on the needed 18 4 gauge cabling. We'll also want to make sure that at the end of this section of our harness, we'll want to leave some extra cable at the end. The extra cabling will be where we'll connect both harnesses together. Now that I have the LED section of our harness done, we'll adjust the wiring so that it's out of the way and stays safe until we source the power adapter, and we'll move on to setting up the harness for the buttons. The harness for the buttons will not be wired in parallel like the LED buttons. Each of these buttons will be wired independently of one another and will not have any interaction with each other, unlike the LED power harness, which can share a single power input. I will also be using the colors green and white for the buttons. This is again to help me identify what kind of cabling I am interacting with, as the red and black will correlate to the power, and the white and green will pair with buttons. In the particular vertical I work in, this is how we color code the cabling, and it just feels natural to me. This will also be helpful for me in the future if I have to do any service to any of the internally modified parts. Just like with the LEDs, the buttons will need to be connected via female spade connectors, as each of the switches on the button has a male counterpart. I also feel as if this is a great time to reach out to you and ask that you help me beat the YouTube algorithm by hitting that like button, leaving me a comment in the description, and clicking on the notification bell. If you've not already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel. Each of these is a small click of the mouse for you, but for this little channel, those small clicks mean the world. Thank you for helping this small channel grow. With that customary channel plug out of the way, I know some people would prefer a third action button on the control deck, 
but I'd argue that we'll be able to get more compatibility for more consoles and more total games by adding a coin or select button for each player. Now that we have the lower half of the wire harness done, let's move up to the control deck and start with those modifications. I'll set the modified front panel and coin doors to the side, and let's start removing the control deck from the cab. We need to remove the control deck and disassemble the unit so we can gain access to the internal components and to modify the lower section of the deck. To remove the deck, we simply need to remove the four screws that hold it in place. There will be two cables that also need to be disconnected, but once done, the control deck will lift out of the cab. After the control deck is removed, we'll need to disassemble the unit so we can find the control deck's PCB board. When removing the screws from the bottom of the deck, I did find that the deck had very deep screw holes, and I do want to recommend using a screwdriver with a magnetic tip. The magnetic tip isn't so much needed when disassembling the unit, but when it's time to reassemble the unit, the tool will help save time. When I disassemble a new cab, I sometimes worry that I'll disconnect something important, and I'll not remember what ports the cable corresponds to. I do my best to combat this fear by taking pictures of any device I feel I may need help with. The control deck's PCB board is no different. This device has a multitude of connections, and I'll want to have a way to verify that I've connected all of the stock controls back into the same PCB ports. I find that pictures are a simple and easy way to give myself a way to double check if my memory is still as sharp as it once was. For the record, more often than not, the pictures serve their intended purpose. All that said and done, once we have disconnected the control deck and removed our control deck PCB, we're going to need to see how hard it's going to be to add ports to the blank inputs. So let's move over to my desk, and let's take a closer look at the PCB we need to modify. After taking a close look, I believe the best route is to add ports to the PCB. To do so, we'll need our 2.54mm PCB ports, some disposables like electrical tape, and solder, but you'll also need the soldering iron I spoke of in the beginning. And again, the soldering iron third hand is very helpful. You could skip adding the ports and hardware for your buttons and add the cabling directly to the PBC board. However, hardwiring to the PCB will make servicing the unit in the future a pain in the bottom. Because of this, I'll be installing ports on the PCB, and each of those ports will have a pigtail that will connect to the wiring harness. Again, you can find links to all of this in the description, you'll be supporting the channel, and you'll have confidence in knowing you have the right part. As I said, I'll be cheating and using the third hand. I'm going to cheat today because, although soldering isn't very hard, it really seems to help if you have a device holding items still for you. I'm not only going to cheat and use the third hand, but I'm also going to cheat a little more by using the electrical tape to hold each of the PCB ports in place as I add solder to each solder point. Each of the ports has two pins, and each of those pins fits right into the PCB's solder points. If you have the right parts, you'll not have any issues with the placement of the ports, they all should basically slide right into place. If you are having issues, then stop what you're doing, as I think you have the wrong part, and forcing the port into the PCB will break the unit. Once I have the ports in place, I'm going to tape the ports down but not block any of the underside of the PCB with the tape. This is done because all of the solder points for each of the ports are on the back of the PCB. I'll also be adding a little tape to each area that my third hand will come into contact with. In truth, I don't think I need to do this, but the alligator clips on this third hand has me tripping people. After everything is in place, I add solder to both solder points on each of the blank inputs. If you do the same as I, you too will end up with a PCB board that will have inputs that are the same size as the stock and will be able to accommodate new buttons. I did notice that there are four other blank spots that look like they could be inputs for four more buttons, however, I've no idea what they are for. I also saw what looked like a single larger port at the bottom of the board. Again, I've got no idea what this is, but for our needs, we're done with the board, and we need to move over to the control deck wire harness. As was just mentioned, the construction of this harness will consist of two separate parts. You have witnessed the construction of the coin door and button side, and at this point it is time to construct the control deck PCB side. This is going to require our 18 gauge wire and our spade connectors once more. However, for this part of the process, we will be adding the pigtails that will connect to the PCB ports. Since I don't feel like soldering, I'll be taking a shortcut, I'll terminate the pigtails to the harness using what we call in my vertical, beanies. 
This section of the process is where we will add the pigtails. It's likely that people in my industry refer to them as beanies, but in reality, they're simply referred to as bee connectors. The construction of this harness is a very simple process. We will need this portion of our harness to be able to connect to the PCB board and have disconnects for each of the lines that will be running through it. By doing this, we will be able to connect and disconnect the cab from the control deck as needed. If we do this, when the time comes for us to perform maintenance on the unit, we won't have to cut any wires. We need only detach them from the deck in order to take it down. Obviously, this also affords us the opportunity to reconnect following any maintenance that may have been performed. I am fully aware that I could easily connect the necessary cables to the PCB board and buttons by employing the technique of hardwiring them, but doing so would lack the adaptability of constructing a harness instead. When we build this section of the harness, just like when we built the first section of our harness, we will compress the necessary spade connectors onto the 18-gauge cabling that we will be using. However, this time, in addition to compressing the spade connectors, we will also compress the B connectors when we terminate the pigtails on the PCB port. Similar to how we individually fabricated leads for each of the coin door buttons, we will need to individually fabricate leads for each of the PCB ports. Basically this is done, one for one, for each PCB and button, and we'll need to make sure to keep track of each line. More will be said about that at a later time. Right now, let's speak about the control deck base. This section of the mod is going to be kind of short, as all we need to do is make a small hole in the back of the control deck base so we can pass our wiring harness through the hole. I'll say that I did make my hole larger than I needed to. However, I did this as I planned on adding one more cable for the trackball in the future but that's going to be in another video. Besides, right now, we need to focus on installing the control deck's PCB board. Installing this unit back into the control deck is very similar to uninstalling it, and because I took a ton of pictures before I disassembled the unit, I had no issues putting it back together. Basically, we'll just install it in the exact reversed order that we disassembled the unit in. First, we'll mount the unit, then we'll connect all the stock cabling, and when done, we'll add the four ports on our harness to the control deck's PCB. Once we have everything installed and we feel that all the ports have a good connection, it will be time to route the cabling. For those of you with a good eye, you may have seen the 12-in-1 encoder for the trackball. I did install the encoder at this time, and I routed the cabling for it, but in full disclosure, I've not done any hardware setup for that encoder in my emulators as of yet. That will be done in a future video. Right now, let's concentrate on reinstalling the control deck, but more importantly, we'll connect each of our cables on our harness to each of the buttons on the front of the cab. This is very easily done. The hardest part will be identifying what cable on the harness goes to what coin button. I labeled each of the lines on my harness with some tape, and I used the first letter of the color of each player to help me identify what line on the harness goes to what player. For example, I used R for the red in player 1, B for the blue in player 2, G for the green in player 3, and for player 4 or Lisa, I used the letter Y for yellow. After identifying the line that corresponds to the coin door, we simply attach both sides of the harness, and we now should have buttons that are identifiable by Team Encoder's Mystery Dawson Experience, also known as the Simpsons 4 player fix. The only thing we have left to do is enter RetroArch, program these new buttons to work with our system, and test these games out. I'll now power my cab up, and I'll enter RetroArch to configure these new buttons. As I said earlier in my video, you will have to complete two software steps first, so if your cab doesn't look similar to mine, that is why. Again, if you need to do these steps, please find the links to those videos in the description. One is for setting up the Mystery Dawson experience, and the other is for installing a home menu. Just remember that when you do have RetroArch installed, if done as I did, you should simply need to head to your settings area and navigate to the input section. Once in the input section, go to each player controller one at a time and program the new key. Because I want these buttons to function as a coin button in arcade gameplay and act as select keys when emulating consoles, I'll program each key to the select button in the RetroArch controller configuration, and I'll save those changes. Now that we have our configuration out of the way, let's look at some of these games, and to do so, I'd like to start with a 4-player NES game. Yes, 4-player NES. For those of you who don't know, Gauntlet 2 for the NES is a 4-player game. In the 80s, you'd have to have a device called a NES 4-score for any 4-player action you wanted, and the NES even had a few games that would take advantage of this. Rampage, sadly didn't make that list.
I figured, because I showed you Gauntlet 2 for the NES, I'd now do the original Gauntlet for the arcade. Again, this four-player game is able to use the main core in Retroarch to its fullest extent because of the Mystery Dawson experience, and with coin door buttons that can also act as a select button, you get the feel of the arcade when playing those games and better compatibility overall on your two-button console setups. If I'm honest, this setup just feels perfect for this cab, and it's also easy to navigate. Again, with the arcades, let's launch Rampage. This is a very simple game that's a ton of fun to play. I do have the arcade 1UP version, but I modded that with a PC to play first-person shooters, and that happens to have its own set of videos. Regardless, Rampage plays really well and feels good. This mod is not limited to 3- and 4-player games. If you're at home and alone, do not worry, as 1- and 2-player games work great too. I've got to admit, I'm really happy with how these buttons turned out. They work great, and I can't wait to add the LED lighting. Make sure you stay tuned for that video, and remember, we still have the trackball to add. Basically, I've already done all the hardware for the trackball. I've just got to add the games and figure out how to configure the controls. That mod should be fun, and it will give us access to games like Golden Tea, Marble Madness, Birdie, and a bunch of others. It should prove to be a fun mod, and I can't wait to share it with you all. For our last game, I'll share Goonies 2 on the NES, and I'll say that I hope you've enjoyed the video and found it informative. I would like to ask that you like this video and leave me a comment in the comment section. Click that notification bell if you've not done so yet. Please consider subscribing. All of these are small clicks of the mouse for you, but for this small channel, those little clicks mean the world. Thank you.